Right, so what we're seeing um, across Europe and elsewhere, initiatives um, taking place to open up the banking sector. So in the UK, we have the uh, Competition and Markets Authority, and it's driving change to encourage consumers to switch banks, uh, thereby promoting competition and improved services in that sector. Technology plays an important part in this, and uh, we would like to welcome Rolf Bragg today, um, who's been working on the development of the technology and the architecture that will help facilitate this here in the UK. Thanks very much, Rob. I'm aware that we're a couple of minutes over time. Uh, I have quite a few, uh, a large number of slides. Uh, this is meant to be mainly an information communication session uh, to bring you all up to speed with uh, the differences between PSD2 and open banking. Um, I hope to have some uh, time for questions at the end, but if I don't, uh, please come and grab me at the, whenever you'd like to have, have a chat. So uh, this uh, the title of the DEX is Crafting an Open Banking Ecosystem, where we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into some of the standards, some of the frameworks, and some of the differences between the two initiatives and uh, a bit of a compare and contrast. Um, a brief bit about me. Uh, I'm Australian, living in London, giving a presentation in Chicago, so I do like this. It's a truly multicultural and international um, role. Uh, I'm a senior partner for Radium, which is a identity and access management consultancy based in the UK, providing professional services around identity to a large number of the UK banks, uh, and particularly the CMA9's open banking uh, implementation entity. So where are we today? We have a financial technology landscape that's ripe for identity innovation. Um, we've already touched on a little bit of PSD2, but we've, in PSD2, the European Banking Authority's Payments and uh, Services Directive, We've got 28 member states, 24 official languages, 508 million inhabitants. It's technology neutral. Uh, it allows for a huge amount of interpretation. It allows for individual banks, individual national competent authorities to all come up with their own standards and their own ways of trying to address this change. Well, one of the goals for PSD2 was to try and reduce barriers of entry for trusted payments parties to allow them to innovate with your data and access your information to create new products and services for you. But we've got 24 different official languages, 28 different states, 15 banks in each, uh, in each of those states, each creating their own standards, their own APIs, their own security infrastructure, and their own trust framework. Well, I'd argue that the, uh, for PSD2, the barriers to entry haven't been eroded at all. Um, in addition to PSD2, we've got the General Data Protection Regulation, which is another piece of uh, regulation coming out of the European Commission, again, same sort of problem. Um, the uh, overall principle is to return asset ownership, to empower the user, to give you back your data. Your account information, your personal information is now yours. But we're not going to come up with a standard way for you to get it. We're not going to come up with a standard set of APIs, and we're not going to come up with a standard trust framework. Good luck. Um, in contrast, take the UK. Well, the UK's Competition Markets Authority looked at the work that was coming out of PSD2, and it just so happened that it was running its own analysis of the UK banking sector. And these two stats, uh, which you know, really shouldn't surprise anybody, 60% um, of retail customers haven't changed their banks. I haven't. I've been banking uh, with the same bank, HSBC, now for 11 years. Um, my company, surprise, surprise, banks with HSBC. People don't really like moving their banks around. You invest time, you invest relationships, but as a result, the Competition and Markets Authority are concerned that you're not getting the best service. You're not getting you know, a, a modern, innovative financial product because you really do have a sticky relationship with your banks. So they looked at PSD2 and said, look, how can we take this and give this teeth? How can we develop a, a standard such that it would promote innovation would promote uh, or lower barriers of entry, would enable and foster the innovation that we're all looking for in financial services. So the CMA got the big, uh, the CMA nine, or the top nine banks in the UK, stuck them in a room and said, you guys, listen here, you're all gonna get together and you're gonna build a common trust framework, a common set of security standards, and a common functional set of APIs. And you're all gonna do it in the same time frames, and you're all gonna go live on the 10th of January all together. No pressure. Um, so what we're after is a single functional specification, single technical specification, a single trust framework, all of which are required to make the whole ecosystem work. So I was brought in um, to the open banking implementation entity to look at how we can develop the trust framework, how we, can we 
get the banks to agree and consolidate onto a single technical set of standards. So we started off by looking around and seeing, you know, what really are the building blocks for making up this e ecosystem? Well, we've got digital identities, as we've been talk uh, talked about before. Everything that we're doing in open banking is all about the identities. It's about the identities of the customer. It's about the identities of these new third parties that are going to be coming on. It's about identity information being, uh, or attestations being provided by national competent authorities. And we needed uh, to cater for data protection and asset ownership changes under GDPR. Um, we need to, oh, there's a, I see what you mean now about the, uh, the slide. And we need to uh, use these services and use these technologies and these, um, these cocktails of information to provide account information and payments and uh, information. And basically, account information services is uh, any information that you might have about your transactional history, your account information, your credit card uh, balance, your uh, personal account balances, your payees, your trusted beneficiaries, uh, must all be made available via API. Um, same with payment services. So we're starting with single immediate payments, so the ability to instruct a third party to immediately take money from your bank account as opposed to using a credit card. But all of these four technical requirements or regulatory requirements coupled with the power of digital identity um, raises some really, really interesting challenges but also some great opportunities for third parties that can use all these four services to build some new applications and new, um, uh, new services. So quick, touching quickly on the open banking stakeholders, we've, uh, we've got the European regulators, we've got the UK regulators, we've got the UK uh, uh, banks, both challenges and the existing CMA9. We've got to take into account uh, third parties, both the new entrants that want to come in and play in this new ecosystem, as well as trusted, uh, or sorry, uh, existing third parties that may be doing things like screen scraping in order to be able to access informa this information today. And then we've got the Open Banking uh, Implementation Entity, or Open Banking Limited, which has got its own group of people trying to pull all these and manage all these stakeholders together. Um, the major contributors to the specifications include the, the, uh, the nine banks listed on the left, um, as well as uh, industry experts such as the OpenID Foundation's Financial API Working Group, uh, Ping Identity, Forge Rock from IAM, uh, and as well as uh, additional experts that have been recruited by the Open Banking Implementation Entity. So moving on to the technology uh, trust framework, you've heard a lot about um, OAuth 2 and the rise of OpenID Connect and the fact that Open Banking is embracing the FAPI working group, but we haven't discussed really why. Well, why OpenID, uh, OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect? Well, they're regulatory well suited. If you, in, in fact, if you talk to Nat or you talk to John, some might say that this model was designed for the financial, or exchanging financial information or financial contracts, and indeed that it was. Uh, a very, very long time ago. Each one of the entities inside the OWALT model maps very, very nicely onto um, the model being proposed and the legal requirements and structures being put in place by the European Banking Authority and the Financial Contact Authority. But the most important thing about why uh, OWALT 2 and OpenID connect for me is that it's a delegated authorization model. Users are never encouraged or are required to surrender their credentials. They provide delegated authorized access to third parties with consent to be um, to access resources that they own. So further to the first speakers that we heard this morning, yes, it's entirely possible that banks could become the custodians of all data um, and all resources inside the OAuth model. And open banking and PSD2, if they, you adopt the open banking trust framework and the open banking security solution specification, would be a way of allowing delegated uh, access to those resources with consent. Now, I mentioned consent, uh, and consent's been talked, uh, talked about a lot at this conference as being the linchpin to everything here. There is no point in putting in or re-empowering the users if you don't give them the ability to control consent. But how does consent work, and, and how does authorization, well, what's the difference between consent and authorization, and what information needs to be uh, exchange between different actors in the open banking ecosystem such that it also meets GDPR compliance, which basically is about data minimalization, where only an act the actors are only ever given the exact information that they are required in order to be able to do their job. Well, again, here it is where Open OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect um, is a very, very good fit. So let's have a look at the difference between uh, consent and authorization. I'm going to take the example of a, a 
payments initiation service provider. So this is a third party that is trying to debit my account, take some uh, funds to buy something. So typical customer journey or cust uh, uh, customer workflow, I'm on Amazon and I wish to buy a television. It's a nice television, it's a red television, it's got a nice little slim bezel, it's 42 inches, it's uh, cutting edge technology and it's going to cost me $748.56. Well, under payments legislation in Europe, consent is a very is a key thing, but a consent is something that is entered into between myself and my merchant. I am entering into a, con a consent of transactional relationship to buy this exact television to be shipped to this exact address for this amount of money. Well, in an open banking ecosystem, let's have a look at what authorization or what information the bank needs. And you can see it's a lot less, it's a lot less. The bank only needs to know that I wish to pay Amazon $748.56 from this particular account to that particular account. Under OAuth 2 and the, the uh, OpenID flows, you can separate um, these different types of information or these different types of consent workflows such that each party only has access to the relevant piece of information for them to be able to do their jobs. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to, I won't read the slides, the slides should be made available. Uh, so let's go, moving on, let's have a look at uh, OpenID Connect. You've heard about uh, OpenID Connect as being, or OAuth 2 as being a framework, and there being a uh, whole bunch of different profiles available for uh, securing OAuth 2 flows. Uh, on the right-hand side, you've got, uh, well, I've listed six, uh, six profiles with various different characteristics. Um, as you move, uh, unfortunately, given the state or the early, uh, the, I was to say, the new state of the FAPI specifications and the lack of vendor adoptions, by requiring the very, very latest of security specifications um, be implemented by the 10th of January, well, there was an unacceptably high risk of uh, risk to the delivery of the program. So the goal for uh, myself and the open banking team was to look at all the specifications coming out of FAPI, um, coming out of the IAM vendors, working with the banks to work out who's got what, what versions, to come up with a pragmatic approach that would provide appropriate security for all of the participants in the ecosystem balanced against real, you know, hard legal deadlines for delivery of the entire solution. So. If we targeted the latest security um, standards, we would lower participant risk for everybody, but we would most likely fail to meet our delivery risks. At least certain banks would, um, would have str certainly struggle. So what do we try and um, settle on? What we decided up front was in order to meet the requirements, we had to have signed messages. We had to have signed non-repudiable consent objects exchanged between all participants in the ecosystem. And it turns out that this feature has been available inside OpenID Connect core specification for almost two years. Unfortunately, it had a very a lack of vendor adoption because nobody was asking for it. The social media use cases were fine. We don't need can, um, lots of Titan or high security. And this is one of the first implementations in a highly regulated environment where we've said, no, we do need this specification. It went out to the banks and said, guys, do any of your vendors support this? And they all came back and said, no, but we will shortly if you all really need it. So all the banks in the UK, in addition to having to go and build a whole bunch of functional APIs integrated with a new trust framework, are having to do a major security upgrade of all of their identity and access management vendors uh, in order to meet our deadlines. So the JWT OIDC request object uh, is a very flexible pay structure that allows you to stick whatever you like in it and uh, ensure that information can be exchanged between two parties um, in a flexible format. Key to the, or one of the reasons that we want to use this object is it allows information to be specified by a TPP that may not be known or agreed up front between the two parties. If you think about a traditional OIDC um, flow, you have got, uh, or the example would be on the right, say a Facebook flow, where Facebook knows that I've got six resources, I've got my permissions to post on my wall, I've got my email address, I've got my friend's history, and I've got maybe, I don't know, uh, my phone number. Now that information is known by Facebook, it's described in scopes, and Facebook can publish that information for developers to use. Developers can ask, know that they can ask for email, or post on wall, or retrieve you know, friends list, 
But what does it mean in, in the financial use cases where we actually need to describe consent objects at a very, very, very low level? And an example of this is given on the left, uh, on the left hand side. So using the OpenID Connect uh, JWT request object, a third party can ask for, I would like permission to access your current account balance. It's this sort code and account number. I need for three days, I want uh, uh, debits only and if they're above 1,000 pounds. Now we don't have that flexibility in the specifications for coming out with uh, for open banking for release one, but this structure gives the ability for TPPs to describe those objects the limits really are uh, in terms of implementation and you know, one of implementation and standardization. How do we all agree what degree these resources can be modeled? How do we get all the banks to agree what a current account looks like? What all the bank, the resources within that current account looks like? What all the fields and attributes are for an account uh, transaction record? That's the, was one of the key challenges. So stitching it all together, we had to go and say, okay, fine, we're gonna um, pick OpenID Connect Core section 6.1 for if inf describing how parties are gonna communicate messages. But how are we gonna identify all those parties? What trust framework are we gonna put in place that establishes a relationship between open banking or a national competent authority like the FCA or the German equivalent, the Spanish equivalent, um, basically the regulate or regulatory body that is authorized to ordain people to act as either account information service providers, so companies that wish to take all your payments, in from, sorry, your transaction history and aggregate them and give you a you know, credit score, for example, or act as a payments provider such as PayPal, um, or even uh, ordain uh, p uh, organizations to act as account servicing payment services providers, which is a fancy name for saying banks or building societies. So how do we stitch all these together? Well, on the left-hand side, uh, Open Banking will be standing up a, an IDP. It will be the trusted uh, authority that will be ordaining identities. And many thanks to P uh, Ping's Pam Dingle for uh, borrowing this slide, or allowing me to borrow this slide. Um, and what will exist is a transitive trust relationship between this authority and the TPPs, and this authority and the uh, or, and the ASPSPs, which allows a single common unified uh, source of truth about all of the identities, about all the banks, about all the information about how to connect and how to exchange data, contact details for all of the registered participants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what we've tried to do is offer inside open banking just the central services that will net result in a lower barrier of entry. Now, when somebody says, wait, hang on, you've got a new big agency going to be stood up to um, that we have to onboard to. I don't know that's a barrier to ensure I'd much rather go and talk to all the banks directly. Well, the banks have got a huge task ahead of them in terms of vetting all of the ID uh, or companies that come on board, vetting all the individuals who are associated with those companies, checking that they are appropriately accredited, et cetera, et cetera. So purely from uh, an economies of scale point of view, it made sense to offer that services inside a single location and then offer that identity out as a federated uh, source of I was a federated identity provider. So stitching it all together, we're going to be offering a certificate authority, policy enforcement services, authentication services for individuals and companies. We're going to be providing data access and governance controls, a central location that would allow all participants to access an information registry via an API to retrieve details about how many banks are out there in the open banking system? How do I consume them? How do I access all of their authorization services and open ID? Uh, providers, as well as for the banks, how do I know a TPP that's connected to me is authorized for the roles that they're asking to? Um, there's a whole bunch of, uh, another slide uh, that's listed, um, I'll just throw it in all there for reference, which includes all of these sort of activities in order to build those six core capabilities, we need to deliver all of these technical specifications. The, this process is uh, ongoing now, it's open for uh, to the, uh, for anybody to contribute if they feel that they have a genuine uh, stake, uh, stakeholder. We've got TPPs, we've got new startups, we've got existing banks, uh, other, you know, large fintechs, small fintechs, regulators, and lots and lots of people from the identity community helping to build this system together, or pull the system together. From a timeline's point of view, open banking is going to be going into industry testing inside the next 12 weeks, where we wish to have a production version of this service up and running, where TPPs would be able to leverage the identity services provided by Open Banking, where we want to have integrated with other identity services to help us 
uh, like UK's Gov Verify program, uh, or indeed some of the other banks that wish to become identity providers uh, to help us prove and vet and, um, and validate all of the different identities that we need to onboard into this ecosystem. Uh, and that's about it from me. So if you'd like more information, you can find uh, information on both uh, Radian's website, but also openbanking.org.uk. You, uh, you can enroll for compliments. You can find access to the technical specifications, the trust framework demos. You can enroll for test accounts. And you can have a look and really start seeing uh, the shape of this service uh, emerge. And if you'd like to, and we really like to encourage all of the identity uh, professionals here to get involved and help shape it now while it's in its infancy. Any questions? Hi, do you see similar um, behavior and activities within other countries within the UA? Uh, within the e within European Union, yeah. So the Germans, are, uh, the Berlin Group, have sort of got the together. They try to uh, um, drive through a common set of standards. But what you're finding, uh, and this is one of the, the the challenges, and I'll use this uh, opportunity to address one of the points that uh, you raised earlier. So a lot of the banks are scared about becoming identity providers because if you take this this model where they're making available all of their account information, all their payment service information, well, really the last thing they've got is their security relationship with their customers. And if they allow that service to then start being used by other people, well, hang on a minute. If I'm um, Barclays and I can use RBS's IDP on my Barclays website and I can extract all of the customer's account information, get their current balance, initiate a payment to, uh, to a newly created Barclays account, which I use by, create, by use their RBS identity to open automatically an RBS bank account, well, what's left? I've been forced to give away my account information, forced to give away my payments information, and now I'm forced to give away my identity. And those three things would allow any other financial services institution to literally open a new bank account on behalf of that user and migrate all funds, all transaction history, all beneficiaries uh, to a new banking services provider, or by API, or with the customer's explicit consent. Really, final, you know, just a final point on that. A really scary one is what happens when all of this is long lived? What happens when computers are automatically opening bank accounts? You, know, you may delegate a permission for a third party account opening management app to be able to open accounts for you. And they will automatically have the ability to automatically move funds from one account to another account, all at the blink of an eye and all via APIs. What does this program mean for systemic risks to the UK's financial services industry? the stability of payments, liquidity ratios, and what does it that for mean uh, as a systemic risk to the global economy's uh, risks? And it won't happen for a huge, you know, in a, you know, the short term, but these are some of the challenges that long-lived consented access to account information and potentially payments raises for, uh, for banks when it comes to managing uh, liquidity. Any more questions? Uh, this is fascinating. So one of the questions that I had was, all this thing, is that being pushed by the customers, the consumers, or is it just the regulators who want to have more control? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. So arguably, it's a, everything here is being done for the benefit of the PSU, and that's the most important thing from the security, uh, from a security point of view and from an identity point of view. All of this has to be done in a way that, that ensures that customers have the most protection possible, which becomes a challenge when you're talking about delegated new entrance participants, uh, the, the, the requirement to allow any third party to start consuming this information without putting contracts in place between banks and those, those, uh, those third parties. Has the need really been expressed from a consumer point of view? I'm not sure. Um, what has been demonstrated to consumers so far in all of the working groups is that they love it. They love the idea, they love the, uh, the whole uh, model of allowing TPPs and third parties to provide all of these services whilst having the banks as that trust anchor, that banks as that, sec that security anchor. Whether or not the banks will like it is a, another question. And, uh, that was really a leading question because what I saw was, I think UK is taking the lead for it, right? So what happens with Brexit? 
Um, yeah, very good point. Uh, very good point. So the CMA. So firstly, PSD two is going to be in place before Brexit takes place. So uh, the UK will still be compelled by law to adopt these standards. But secondly, the Competition and Markets Authority is far more restrictive, and is has, is probably the most technically explicit set of standards being implemented for a, a national financial services industry worldwide. Um, there is no plans to change that. If anything, this will potentially be used as a model for forcing other industries to open up their data and open up their services. Uh, so no change for Brexit. Hi, so on the certificate authority, we kind of uh, glanced over some, some details there. I could see it very challenging to, to run that kind of um, CA um, with, with, uh, in this environment. Uh, what are the thoughts on the, the, the organization that would be would actually implement and run the, the CA? So the CA is going to be a managed outsource service deliberately to address most of those requirements. It is expensive to run, to run a CA. Um, we did have a, a requirement, or the RFP has been uh, has been sort of been completed. We have selected the vendor for the delivery of that service. Um, it will be delivered by, as a managed uh, managed product. However, Open Banking will be the issuing authority. So Open Banking via, uh, via API will be able to mint certificates um, using a hosted CA platform. Um, I'm sorry, we're out of time now. So uh, I'd just like to thank Ralph for a very informative and um, illuminating presentation. Ralph, thank you very much indeed for coming along today. Thanks. Thank you.